phase. That is fantastic. <laughs> All right. Um, I call the meeting to order. Welcome to the June 6th at the school committee meeting. Uh, is there a motion to open the meeting? So moved. Seconded? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Here we go. Uh, thanks for rescheduling. And I know we're going to meet twice this month, so double dose of school committee in June. Twice the phone. Yes. <laughs> um, adjustments to the agenda. We have a few. We're going to reorder some things, if that's okay. Um, we'd like to have the FY19 budget revisions first, then the uh, update on the field. Is it fields or field trips? Uh, fields. 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 Yeah. Got it. Um, then business manager reports, because I know you need to cut out of here for another obligation. Uh, and then we'll go back into uh, student recognition to yep. pick it up with yep. the uh, discussion items. And we also would like to add the Hopkins Academy schedule and program offerings to discussion items as a new topic. All right. So with that, we'll start then with uh, fiscal year 19 budget revisions. Okay, so the good news, what you have in your packet is a, uh, one is a Word document summary of where we've been and where we are right now. What the school committee, in order to have a balanced budget on July 1, hi Tara, Tara. and we're starting with the budget, Tara. Um, in order to have a balanced budget on July 1, we need to, the school committee really needs to revote total expenses and revenues. So in, on April 9th of your public hearing, you had voted a level service budget, or recommended and voted a level service budget with total expenses of $8,542,398.65. And the revenue assumptions included a local contribution of $7,092,482.98, circuit breaker at $275,000, and then grant revenues and school choice. At town meeting on May 3rd, the select board recommended a local contribution of $7,039,167, which was $53,315.98, less than the local contribution that was requested. So based on that, we needed to adjust the expenses, although the select board was clear at town meeting and uh, David Nixon stated when somebody in the audience asked, why is there a discrepancy between what was recommended, in other words, the school committee's recommendation, and what the select board is recommending, and Mr. Nixon stated, the plan is after revenues have been certified, particularly, I believe, hotel occupancy and meals, has, after that has been certified and free cash is certified, that it's all town meeting, that the school committee's request would be honored. But we're required to have a balanced budget on July 1, and we can't say, and we also, so we just need a balanced budget. So Chris and I worked together to say, all right, how will we reduce expenses? How can we postpone, what could be postponed until after fall town meeting? Also, from the time of fall town meeting until now, there have been a number of changes to our operating expenses. So one thing that you notice that we're proposing you proposing to you is an actual reduction in total expenses as of what we know right now. The primary reduction is due to the fact that we have had changes in our financial obligations for special district out of, uh, out of district placement tuitions and transportation. So that's what has had the greatest impact um, on, the, on the reductions. So we reduce the expenses to reflect what we know right now. We also were notified that a student who initially was going to go to Smith Vocational has decided not to go to Smith Vocational. So that tuition line also decreased. So we decreased our expenses. However, you'll notice that not only our revenues that were applying to the budget, not only did local contribution decrease uh, because of what was voted at fall town meeting, but you see there's also a significant reduction in the amount of circuit breaker that's being applied. So it's not just an even expense reduction. When an out-of-district tuition is eliminated, circuit breaker goes away also. So, um, and that's not entirely what constitutes some of those fluctuations. There are other things that we know in terms of 
um, certainties that we have about other special education expenses or contracted services. Um, but one of the reasons that it isn't just as simple as, oh, we have reduction in tuition, the budget goes down, that's the end of the story, that, that circuit breaker revenue will always also have a corresponding decrease. So we have less circuit breaker to apply, but where we found ourselves was rather than with a $53,000 deficit, it was roughly a $21,000 deficit. So in order to bring the budget to balance, we are recommending postponing some of these expenses, essentially, that you see here. And I've listed them, uh, some of our purchases under subscriptions and supplies, some of our uh, elementary and secondary teaching services, um, some of our training for our tiered interventions and supports, and um, some of the purchasing of regular testing materials. Now, what for the select board to understand, we have a select board uh, representative in the audience, is that tonight you'll vote a budget to bring it into balance. So you agree school choice being applied hasn't changed, you agree with the expenses as, recommend, as presented, and you agree with how we're applying revenues. After fall town meeting, we will bring forward another final FY19 budget if it changes again. It could be that at fall town meeting, something else changes, something changes with tuitions, and we're saying yes, as a matter of fact, we do require the entire reinstatement of $53,000. It could be less. It could be we don't need anything. It could be we don't need anything. So um, when we get to fall town meeting or when we're developing the warrant, the school committee and the select board are developing the warrant for fall town meeting, we just won't know until we're closer. Yeah, I think it's like 75000 or something, right? 53000 53 in the final yeah. budget? Okay. 53. 53315.98. We'll probably call it 316 when we get there. We just like to go right to the penny. <laughs> what yeah. we would like. So, Annie, can you speak to just kind of the criticality of these services that we're saying we're going to postpone until the fall, like um, where we may or may not see an impact? So, because most of the things that we've listed here were subscriptions, supplies, materials, training on things that don't all have to be paid for in the first two months of school. The, the secondary, elementary and secondary teaching services, now this may be one, which is one of the reasons that you don't have every single line in front of you again, because it will most likely change. And you'll understand why this may change when we talk about the schedule at Hopkins. We initially thought that we could probably make a reduction and, and we would be fine with that. As we're looking at the schedule, that's probably not the case, which means that to bring it into balance, which again, your focus is saying, okay, I understand these are the expenses that you believe are known right now. These are the revenues that we have. To bring it into balance, we would probably cut again from materials and supplies, things that we don't buy 100% in September. So you don't purchase all of that in September. Fuel oil. Fuel oil, that would be another place where, um, and that would be an example when, we, when the school committee was working with the select board to prepare for fall town meeting to say, this really was a postponement. It's not like we're going to stop using fuel oil in March. We're going to need this. Um, so if we had to restore that 0.29 FTE, then we would take it from something that we can amortize over the course of the entire year until after fall town. And some of the things that's that I wanted to bring to your attention also on the revisions and the long-term implications for revenue. So over time, and certainly um, Humera and Heather have, have been here a little while, um, on school committee for a little while, that um, over time the school committee has applied an increasing amount of school choice funds to the operating budget. So we continue to apply more and more school choice funds. Um, and so that means we must increase school choice revenue. That's another thing we'll be talking about tonight is opening up slots in grades five and six. Uh, circuit breaker. So I pointed out to you there's a corresponding decrease in circuit breaker revenue and special education cost decrease. And the preschool grant 391, we know that that grant will go away next year. You've been talking about that. So that'll be a $30,000 cut. 
to preschool that will have to be considered and picked up elsewhere in the budget. And we, our nurse leader, Renee Denenfeld, has said that the Department of Public Health is indicating that the nursing and health grant may have stipulations going forward, and those stipulations would, would make it so we could not apply that grant to salaries. That would be a big issue because we apply, as you see, 51665 to salaries. So if those two things were to occur in FY20, we're starting $80,000 in the hole before steps, lanes, goals, and um, yeah. yeah, so I think that, that helps to explain why we would prefer to postpone spending some items than dip into school choice even further. That's, but we're holding to the school choice amount contribution that we indicated we would um, support for this budget, we could support for this budget, despite the difference between the local contribution um, and what was what was determined in May. And I did include some uh, information on school choice revenue projections in your packet. So applying the 695, we'll walk you through that. So our set that's after the line items, uh, it's after the budget, uh, the function subtotal summary. So our balance at the start of this fiscal year was 721132 and change. Our projected revenue for fiscal year 18, this is just all school choice in, not including any special ed increment, just school choice in. This is a fairly accurate figure. This comes directly from the spreadsheets from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So it shows me every single student who's choosing in in FY18, their grade, the town they come from, and the revenue that we receive. The special education increment, the same thing. It shows up right on those uh, spreadsheets. That 159 includes increment and transportation. How much we're applying in FY18 on the budget that you approved? So then our balance. Now you can see the revenues, and I just want to remind you that this is really, this is just me playing Zelda gazing into a crystal ball because that's what I get paid to do here. <laughs> so educated. Uh, and it's based on taking that very same spreadsheet, filtering out all the seniors, and calling that my new total. So what it doesn't take into consideration is anybody choosing in. I also don't know who else you know, is leaving us or things like that. So I don't take that into, cons I, I don't have any new students coming in. The special education increment just again took out all the seniors. That's all it did. So we could have new school choice students for whom we also receive special education increment. So we could receive more than this. We could receive less, some existing school choice students could leave. And then how much you would apply in, in the budget, and that was the amount that you discussed on April 9th. And then where your balance would be if all those things held true at the end of fiscal year 19. That 6% is roughly the percentage of total operating budget. Um, and that I thought was helpful that you know that the select board also has parameters on the floors that they have for certain, for free cash, for, I forget the other one, but um, so this would be about 6% and how much is projected, and what it represents as a policy surplus. So there's your projected grant revenue and then your policy surplus. And you also have estimates for circuit breaker, and um, you can see circuit breaker carryover is, is gotten quite a bit lower. Um, so we're still, even though we reduce the amount of circuit breaker we're applying in fiscal year 19, um, we're not hoarding a bunch of circuit breaker money could otherwise be applying to the budget. Circuit breaker is, you're allowed to carry it over because it's, it's designed to be a sort of, a bit of a reserve if you were to encounter an unanticipated expense. Student moves in from out of state on September 1, you absorb an expense immediately. So this amount that we're projecting will carry over at the start of FY19, uh, $67,693, roughly, $694. That is one 
uh, placement, a tuition at a public school or collaborative program, potentially. That's, that's half of an expensive program, or two-thirds of an expensive program, um, and not even transportation. So it isn't a tremendous amount to carry over. I mean, tuitions, tuitions can easily run $115,000 for single tuition, and transportation can easily run $27,000 for a bus. So a single student going to a more expensive placement, an individual student, that could be uh, $150,000. So we, this is an action item for us. Yep. Um, any questions on the revised fiscal year 19 budget? So I have one question that I think you may have actually just answered with that circuit breaker surplus. Mm -hmm. um, seeing that, that one of the major adjustments is the low, lower amount of circuit breaker coming in um, because of the um, reduction in special ed education, um, what do we have as a buffer? Is it just that circuit breaker? Should circuit breaker and switch funds. Okay. So should should somebody in the middle of the year need mm -hmm. like that's where those funds would come from. Absolutely. Circuit breaker and switch funds. That's also one of the reasons to keep a school choice reserved. And this is quite common, right? This is an adjustment that is Every year, we don't quite know what the free cash situation is going to be, and we make these modifications in the fall when we know exactly. So the town, I think the town routinely, there are other things that the town, it's been, anyone can jump in and correct me, but it's my experience has also been that typically their contracts, whether those are union contracts or they are non union employee uh, personnel agreements. But they typically don't settle those until late summer, early fall, so that all of those adjustments to the budget are made at fall town meetings. That's most of the fall town meetings I've been to. That's typically a warrant article there. So the town does do that. We do our best to try to nail down our budget. But I'm glad you asked the question, Humara. So, you know, for the town side of things, uh, Mr. Stanley, you were voted in just this spring, right? So we usually, um, for good reason. The select board is asking for numbers for the budget starting in December with some preliminary numbers in early January. And our, our tendency to say, well, this is our best guess does not come from a place of just being <laughs> difficult. This is, as you can see, things still change right now. That, that information, Chris and I thought we were having a very different conversation about balancing the budget on Monday. And then Ms. Bell, um, called us and that completely changed that conversation. That was, she was quite good news packed on Monday morning. So that's how quickly things change. So do we want to vote now or do we want to wait till the end? Do that. I'd probably rather do it now. Okay. Chip away at the action items. If that's okay, unless there's other yeah. questions or considerations. Just, well, and, so, and then that reduction of the 0.29 FTE at Hopkins. Um, you said that that may or may not happen so based on the scheduling. If that if that had to be restored, um, then that's where I said the we would still have the reduction. The, the you just pull the money voted, from somewhere else. You just pull it from somewhere else. And so this wouldn't result in diminished services for the students. Correct. So do you want a vote to reduce the budget by twenty three? No, you would just vote the bottom line. Okay. So you're voting the expense line. Right, that's all we yes. have. Eight is eight five. Eight, four two six, eight, eight three six three four nine six, nine seven two. Yeah, eight the the yeah to the bottom of page one. So uh, eight three six three four nine nine point seven two. Yes, this one right here. Yeah. Yeah. So motion to uh, to uh, approve a fiscal year twenty nineteen budget of eight million three hundred and sixty three thousand four hundred and ninety nine dollars and seventy two cents. Thank you for the detailed explanation. And we get to revisit it in the fall. Yeah. We just fun. never stop talking about it. Okay, next was fields. Yes. 
Chris. Okay, so although Paul have... isn't here, that's okay. Yeah. I still think it's good for the whole committee. To... We have some progress on the fields. Um, let's see. A while back, about a month ago, they mentioned that we needed to do some wetland studies. Um, they asked for approval on that, so we approved it immediately. Uh, they came around, they flagged the wetland areas on May 7th. Um, finalized the survey with wetland flags. I don't know if any of you saw that. There's little orange flags out in the outfield. Um, flood elevation information. Um, they needed some work on the um, topographical maps that were done. Apparently they weren't as complete as they would have liked them, so they, they took care of that as well. Um, so now they need to get the plans <clears throat> to the level they can submit to the Conservation Commission. And uh, they said, unfortunately, the Conservation Commission um, requires that the plans are submitted a full month in advance of the hearing. They only meet the second Tuesday of the month, which means that it was not in time for the June meeting. Uh, so that would be the next meeting would be the July 10th meeting. Uh, he said, once we're done with the Conservation Commission, um, they will be done with the plans and specs for bid. And uh, he says, if we could get the notice of intent approved that same night, we would go out to bid immediately. Um, it would take a month for the bidding process. We would be awarding the project second week of August. Construction would start two weeks after that to get paperwork and contracts finalized. Um, construction would take approximately three to four months. So they'll be looking at a November seeding and a reseed in the spring. And then they said another option is to go informally to the next conservation committee, uh, committee hearing on June 12th and uh, propose going out to bid at the same time we submit. Uh, that would ensure, assure the board that we would follow all flood and wetland regulations and have the conditions added as an addenda during bid, bidding or amendment to the contract. Um, now, of course, we don't know how the Conservation Commission feels about that either. Um, you know, a bunch of showing up to the meeting or anything. Um, it might be possible we could reach out to them. <coughs> but the bottom line, <coughs> excuse me, with all of this is that until we have sufficient funding for the fields, this is, it's, it's all work that needs to be done, but it's kind of putting the cart ahead of the horse because we don't have the funds right now to get this done. So um, I know we were waiting on marketing materials from Chick Media. We received those, was it last week? No, I think Two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, they look good, very good. So uh, now what our job is really is to kind of make up that roughly $150,000 shortfall that we have in the project. We can't go out to bid until we have the money because you know, we'll end up going out to bid again. Um, and that, that just doesn't work very well. So, um, so that's really, what we need to do, we need to try to address that shortfall quickly, and then we can move forward with a, an attempt and an aggressive schedule uh, to try to get this done. As I mentioned to Anne, I'm not really a fan of seeding in November because it just seems that then we'd have to re-rake the fields and we seed them again in the spring anyway, so that's not really an option I have. But I'm not the grass expert really either, so. People that know more than I do, it might work, but I, I was really not that excited about that idea. We were kind of looking to be starting the work in July and, and having it going forward from there. So that's where we are right now. Um, the, the part we're at is the need for funds. If we can get the funds, then we can go to the Conservation Commission and really make an attempt to streamline the whole bidding process and get this going. So, I mean, given the the normal submission deadline is June 26th for a July 10th hearing. Right. Um, and the accelerated one was June 12th for the June 26th hearing. I mean, I'm not hearing where by June 12th, which is like next week. It's next Tuesday. Yeah, that we would have a commitment of $150,000 unless someone's got lying around, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, so, but I get, I mean, it seems like that would also be, though, the beneficial way to go for grass seeding because we would right. get it done, yeah. started more quickly. Yeah, I mean, you know, if we could do that, we would certainly be able to go out to bid sooner, assuming, of course, that we would be able to get the money. Right. That's, that's the other wrench in the works. 
So what are the plans? That, I mean, we've got marketing materials, and I know Paul's not here. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, completely fair to ask this without him here, but as far as a marketing plan to obtain that kind of commitment of funding. So we are looking to meet with um, one particular partner. I'm not trying to be, I am trying to be intentionally vague, because we are looking to meet with one particular partner mm -hmm. and seeing the extent to which they can support, how much support they can give to phase one. Mm -hmm. What would be really helpful is if we could identify a partner who would say, we'll, we'll get you a full lot closer. So we'll feel confident going out to bid and we're raising a much smaller amount. And so that will be our, that our goal is to have that meeting set up in very short order. I don't know what their response will be. That's our strategy right now, our best okay. strategy. Otherwise, it's come summer, Eric and some other staff who are willing to assist and I try to sort out um, going out and doing fundraising. And the challenge is we'll probably have to look to, no matter what, uh, creating some sort of friends of um, just as they have for their fundraising efforts. Right. Um, I'm completely committed to this project, but as I'm sure you understand, and as we talked about it, Scope, you even said, that's not what you hired me to do as my number one priority, and it just, it, on any given day, it isn't, depending on what's happening. Right. So, so right now, in the immediate is like having a conversation with a partner that we think may be willing to help us get to a good place in phase one, and then I would suggest that um, really trying to galvanize community support to go before CPA, particularly residents, people who pay that tax, to galvanize community support to say, we would like to see these funds used for this purpose, rather than creating any sort of, just, just committing as, as much as possible. Um, and maybe I misunderstood though, but is it part of their um, CPA's funding coupled with the fact that there needs to be a fundraising effort on our end too? That, that so they that is a the well, they could, they could. There's nothing. There's that's a that's their personal decision, which is fine. They have every right to make that decision. But there's nothing that legally prohibits them from entirely funding. Okay. So if you've got this meeting and um, scheduled in short order, if wanted to go the accelerated route, could you go to the June 12th um, committee hearing, propose going out to bid June 26th, kind of contingent upon getting some commitments? And if we don't get that by June 26th, we can't go out to bid, and then we're going to that <coughs> July 10th hearing. I don't know. I'm trying to think of... Yeah. Do we have to go to a second hearing if we don't go out to bid the first month? Can't we use whatever we decided in the first meeting? But whenever we do go out to bid, can we use? Are you talking about conservation committee? Yes. So it doesn't hurt to do things on a parallel path and on a faster track. So we have a decision in hand and information from them. If it doesn't happen one month and it happens Correct. the next, it ain't no harm. Yes. It would Absolutely. just be better to do all things on a parallel path. Absolutely. Yes. To get the project done. Yes. So it, it took, to me, it is a no-brainer. Even if uh, we miss the window on the uh, open meeting, to to be there, have a presence, have a dialogue, see how much we can accomplish, and uh, get whatever information we need. If we have to go back, we have to go back. Sure. So we're, we'll be even stronger in our in what we need because we went the first time around. Perfect. We'll accelerate the timeline in order to keep so the parallel path. The momentum is important here. here. Yeah, I momentum agree. is important, and summertime can slow down or heat up depending on yeah. how we keep up the pace. Yeah. Okay. okay. I will let them know. Thank you. Sweet. Okay. Business manager reports. You're okay. Up. We have a bunch of them. Thank you. Uh, first up, we have the expense report. I've done a lot of transfers that either zeroed out or brought back into positive a lot of the negative accounts that we have. Um, so it's, it's looking pretty good. It's, if you look at the last page, really, they just tell you where we stand. Um, at this point, well, let me put it this way. At the point in time when I ran this report, which was uh, at the end of May, we had $700,000 left in the budget. Um, right now, because I ran it this afternoon, we have 466000 We ran 
pretty big payroll because it had all of the stipends and a number of the coaches' salaries in there as well. So it was a good sized payroll. Um, 466,000, we have a final payroll that's the big payroll coming up, which will be 700,000 or so. So it doesn't take a genius to do the math and see that we have less money than what we have owing. Um, but we still have, of course, a substantial amount of school choice money. I also have about $60,000 of circuit breaker money that I can transfer to. Um, and so that will bring us back right in line. It's going to be tight, but, um, you know, again, that's kind of what it's supposed to be, really. Do you get that vote from us to, at this meeting or the following meeting? To um, it would probably be at the following meeting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, because we have another exactly. one in June. Um, that'll work better. We'll be much more in line. Um, and what I'd probably have to ask for is just the maximum amount that was in the budget, you know, the remaining amount of that. That way, we find ourselves with a little extra money, I won't use it all. You know, and, and that's, it's always better to get that up to a certain amount. That way I don't have to use it all, you know, versus a vote of saying, you have to use 400000 or whatever it may be. So, um, Questions on the expenses? I was just looking to see what we had committed to for this year. Oh, uh, it's in there. Yeah. It's um, 585, I think. 593, maybe. Five. Maybe the other was something. Here around. it is. It is 593, 415.24. So your school choice yeah. yeah. 593, 415.24. And our balance in there now as of the end of April is showing as 800 something. 833. She's looking at the revolving account. Yeah, yes. revolving account report. Yes, it is. Yep. And do you recall what we had said we needed to leave in there? I mean, you were saying, so when we come back at the end of this month and vote to shift funds from school choice to balance this, it would just be good to know, okay, what are we left with? Given um, and that's on that the, um, school choice projections that Ann had done? We'll make sure it's okay. as to the penny Sorry, as possible. Yeah. Focusing on next year. Yeah. I mean, the only thing is that it, it, it would possibly be a little bit higher if we don't have to use all the funds. If you don't use the entire projected balance at the end of June was 681. Yes. Which is this minus this plus this. Yep. Minus that. Okay. Okay. So the next report we have is the grant report. You can see there's not a lot of funds remaining in the grant. Um, and we're down even lower now. Um, the health grant, Renee and I met again today. And that's scheduled basically by the next payroll that'll be completely used up. Um, the circuit breaker, as you can see, we have 125 left. So that leaves me about $58,000 um, to spend in that account as well. I'm going to just keep it in here again until the very end, probably until July, quite honestly, where I will, you know, you wait until June 30th, then you have those few straggler bills coming in in the first couple of weeks of July, you pay all those, then we see where we stand, and again, if I don't have to use it all, I won't, so it, it actually, it's a little better to wait rather than to just commit to it now, and then, oops, I used too much, well, let's transfer some back, and it really just starts to get messy that way, so... Uh, then we have the revolving accounts report. Lunch, my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I know, I wish I had better news for that. What'd you do with that? We had that one shining month of, uh, of positive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yes, it's, it's down, as you can see. Um, you know, the rest of the accounts look pretty good. Preschool revolving at 78000 we have close to $7,000 coming from Amherst for a couple of students that attended that. Um, so we actually received a good portion of that money, but it was made out to the, I think it was made out to the Hopkins Athletic Revolving Account. So I had to send it back to them and they're, they're sending a replacement. So we can add about $7,000 to that. You know, so it'll bring it back up uh, pretty nicely. Um, school choice as you can see that'll you know that's going to grow again you'll see it 
it's it's so close to May 31st that a lot of these either haven't been received yet or weren't posted on the town site. So um, your next meeting, you'll see all the main numbers for these. Uh, lunch, just to, I, I had a uh, meeting with Diane Zach today just to go over where she stands with collecting um, negative account balances. And she is owed right now in negative balances $4,855.60, which is darn close to the negative amount that she has there within $4. So typically, and I asked her this because I thought that was the case, typically she does pretty well the end of the school year and collecting all these, mm -hmm. I don't remember it being this high in the past. I mean, it's it's really pretty high at this point. So um, she said she reaches out on a pretty regular basis, you know, weekly to bi-weekly, um, mm -hmm. and you know, doesn't get a lot of response, basically. But it just seems to be that when the school year ends, and I know she did get a response from one parent saying, just let me know at the end of the school year what we owe, and I'll bring it back up to zero. So. Mm -hmm. The hope is that we get a lot more of those because, as I said to her today, that amount pretty much makes or breaks whether or not she ends up in the positive or the negative for the year. Right. She needs to work on her subject line in her email, so it's not like school lunch money you owe me. It'd be something like fun cat video. <laughs> I will pass that along to her. <laughs> Can I ask a point of clarification? Sure. So. The monies um, that any family or student would have outstanding, they would include anything that um, the student ha didn't have cash for and would come in and borrow to eat, but would also include any negative balances on the um, my yeah. lunch bucks, my school bucks. Right, whatever they like, no? online. Yeah. Um, and sh uh, why, why does that even go negative? Why is it that when that is zero, that isn't just, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not going in the negative. It has to be refunded in order to purchase. Right. I mean, and it might not show, I don't really know, actually. I've never logged in. It shows a negative here. balance. So it does show a yeah. negative balance. So when you go to re-up your kid's account, it pulls that out mm -hmm. first. But if you borrowed. If you borrowed. If you yeah. Borrowed. yeah. And it also will send you an email. It I does. should, yeah, I should know this. So, um, if I'm incorrect, and the folks would call the policy correct me, but I think that is so. Students don't go into debt for let's call them non-essential stuff. They don't. Ice cream. They can't borrow for ice cream. They can't before lunch. Um, the school committee policy has been, which actually is in line with now what the legislature wants. We don't lunch shame anybody. Whether you're on free and is you don't have money for lunch you'd like a lunch, you get a lunch. And the school committee has never proposed doing a alternate, give me back that tray and I'll hand you a peanut butter sandwich and And so on a regular lunch that that's why it can go into the negative. If that I think that answers your question why I wonder though if the um, kind of to your point, can that my school bucks just go to zero help, help us yeah. in any way? Can they help with some messaging? Because I know like, if you have the app on your phone, it will literally push you a notification saying, Bobby's balance is low. Can you tell I've seen oh, this really? one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He got too much ice cream or whatever. <laughs> but How I, much do you owe us right now? <laughs> <laughs> so it's $3. <laughs> 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 okay, so $4,000. <laughs> default settings that yeah. allow for more easier refunding, that it's like a button right in your mobile app that says, yes, please, uh, you know, ne negate my balance, or... Um, or even messaging. I mean, right. they may not be able to update the, the app, but they, maybe they could help so it's not just Diane. I, I don't know. They can help with messaging, I but that's not a bad messaging. idea. That's yeah. a, that's yeah. a, you know, that if somebody wanted to, that they could link it to something that says pay. It's, it's yeah. a little bit of a pain in the butt to you, get, you do get a notification that you are low. So I've gotten those notifications and I go in and I pay. But going in and then refunding and then checking out, that's, it could be simpler. There's okay. also yeah, if there was a direct link right in the email, you know, if you'd like to make a payment, click here, right, yep. right to your yeah. account. Right. Well, and they, they charge a service charge they do. every time you fund your kid's account. Right. So I usually put, you know, one big chunk right, right at the beginning of the year and I'm like because I don't want to do this every month and not everyone is 
So what else? With the cash flow to add No, I get it. But I also know somebody may not want to go in and, and get up their account now when, they're, yeah, they're going to yeah. pay a $2 and service. And especially if the reason right. that you're waiting to pay it is because you don't have the luxury of having the cash available right. all the mm -hmm. time. Right. Then there's less folks who need a service charge every time which are Right, right. So I suppose we can do some research with yeah. my school bucks. Yep. I'm going to do some of that. Capital plan, which Chris is going to talk about, but I'm just going to remind you the, ta the timeline. So our capital plans, which David already knows, I, I told him, I believe I copied uh, all of you, that we're meeting on the 25th, we would turn in a final capital plan on the 26th. The deadline for the town right now is the 22nd. They've gone from a five year to a 10 year, but they know that ours will come in on the 26th. So this, Chris can take it away with what's changed, what he's recommending. Okay, so year one, I kind of left us this year just to have that air conditioning project still showing up here. Um, we actually, I sent the contracts over to David. I already got them signed from the vendor. So I just sent them to David because we needed town council and town account signatures on them, and, and we're good to go. So Great job, by the way. Thank, thank God, God for that. Actually funded, yeah. um, and uh, for there were actually this afternoon a couple of changes already to the version you have here. Um, the item number four, new cafeteria serving lines with drains. Um, there have been some additions to that line. Uh, when I met with Diane, she took me into her walk-in cooler, which is rusting through the floor. There's also some in the ceiling, um, so it's 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 heading in the wrong direction, shall we say. Um, so we've added that um, and a couple of other items that she had issues with in the kitchen as well. The good side to it is that we took out the tech upgrades. Mike has already taken care of those. So, so the 32000 just comes right out. The net result is we actually have a little bit lower amount for FY19 than what you're looking at right now, which is certainly a good thing. Uh, the girls' locker room remodel in year three, again, that's something that I, I did up the amount on that. Um, I think that, let's see, estimate from 2009, there was no way an estimate we got in 2009 is going to be anywhere near the same in 2019. So I bumped that up to 500000 from the 400 it was. Again, you know, once we move closer to that, we can certainly get pricing. Um, but I just thought it was prudent to to bump that price up a little bit. Um, and, you know, then we have some tech upgrades as well. The following year, and I didn't know if you wanted this in there or not, but we have the athletic fields phase two. Um, again, this is kind of an estimate. Obviously, we're not going out to bid. We don't even have plans and specs for phase two yet, but you know, just to have something in there. Uh, we also have a bus replacement in that year and um, like a small amount for some tech upgrades again. Uh, the year after that, FY22, we're looking at resurfacing the Hopkins parking lot. I spoke with Jeff and he said, yeah, it'll last that long. So um, we, we have that item in there. And again, um, some tech upgrades. Year six, all we have right now are the uh, tech upgrades that, again, these have been in the plan for quite some time. Um, in year six, these are more Chromebooks, more of a Chromebook replacement program, actually, because at that point in time, a lot of the Chromebooks that he's purchased are going on, you know, anywhere from five to ten years old. It's pretty much the end of their life. So he's looking to kind of create a, a system of just you know, changing them over. Um, then the following year, and this this is where things really start to get a little bit, I guess, less clear, because you know you're looking at years seven to ten. These items could change. You know, I mean, something could happen two years from now, we say, uh oh, we need to fix this now. Everything gets shifted out, or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but we have Univent replacements for Hopkins. Those are the heating units in the classroom. Um, again, Jeff said that, you know, these things are, these are the original units. They're just, you know, we kind of band-aid and chewing gum them together every year. For lack of a better term, it's not really that bad, but probably it's literally actual. <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's hard to find parts for them at this point. I mean, it, you know, it's it's not an easy thing. So he's looking at replacing those. 
Um, the following year, we have the always popular grease traps that, I mean, again, that, that could continue to be pushed out. Um, the year after that, we have another school bus replacement. And the final year, uh, Jeff has told me that we would probably need to replace the roof at Hadley Elementary. So, you know, again, that's one of those items. We have it out in year 10. It, it could go to year 12. We could start to develop some major leaks, and it could move to year 7. So, you know, I mean, again, these things, it's kind of a moving target. Um, and again, you know, pricing for year 2 is a challenge to nail down. Never mind year 10, where you just don't know really what, what a new roof is going to cost 10 years from now. But, uh, you know, we have it in there. It's, it's something for the town to go by anyway, just as a heads up that, you know, this is on the radar. And, uh, when was that roof replaced last? The elementary school roof, I believe, is the original one from 98, somewhere around 96, maybe. So, yeah, at that point in time, of course, it will be 2027, so it's, it's roughly 30 years old at that point in time. Um, is that 92.5 in health and security, um, is that about that, uh, that walk-in you were talking about, or is that that walk-in? No, uh, health and security, and I, I, I hesitate, quite honestly, to get into too much information about the security upgrades, but That's the health portion is just a continuation of replacing the drinking fountains of the school. Okay. Um, and, and so that's the health aspect. The security items are items that we've discussed. In an executive uh, session. Yep. And I could go into greater detail with you uh, at that point in time. But they are several of the items that we discussed in the executive session a couple months ago. I'm glad to see that they're placed where they're placed yes. as well. Yeah. Yes, year one. And so that would be fall town meeting was really yeah. looking to have those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I actually told Jeff that, you know, in anticipation, fingers crossed, of approval, tell the vendor that we want him to come in immediately after it's approved to get that going. So we will. As far as the school buses go, they're okay to wait that long too. I believe as so at this point in time, yeah. I mean we you know, we replaced one a couple of years ago. Um, and the other one, I forgot the year that it was bought, but you know, I, I think we can go out to to 2022 with that. Um, and then the one we bought a couple of years ago would be replaced in FY26. Again, it's kind of just a, you know, rotation of, of inventory more or less. And uh, this would, you know, both for a safety um, degree and also a financial where, you know, same as a car, we get to the point of where you need a repair every other month and it's almost better to just buy a new one. It'd be the same with the buses. Aside from the updates that Chris has mentioned, is there anything that you would like added or deleted prior to June 25th? This would be what we would be submitting to the town. So he's indicated he'll be updating the cafeteria, item four. But are there anything, is there anything that, that sticks out for you in terms of, is there anything missing? I think the question, oh, sorry. No, no, no. Um, I know we keep talking about our retreat this summer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the, the topics that I know we've batted around is just the structure of this building and the longevity of the structure of this building. And um, whether or not it's worth seriously considering looking at this part of a 10-year capital plan, what is the future of this particular structure? And in relation to um, our census data and size and needs and just um, age, of this building. So like, that's not something that we can necessarily put on here by the June deadline. I think we have to discuss it, and I don't think it's anything that any one of us may personally be tackling as a committee by the time this rolls around, but I think it's worth at least having a discussion about what information would we need in order to think about, okay, longevity, structurally sound, is this meeting the educational needs of, of our children? Uh, or are we band-aiding things that we shouldn't pay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about the capital plan, of course, is that it's, it's not like 
the town says, well, you gave us a 10-year plan. We'll see you in 2028. Yeah, you right. know, I mean, we, we update this every year. So yep. something that is not on here this year can certainly be placed in any one of the years next year. So. Right. Well, I think it's great that they're thinking 10 years instead of five years because that's helpful. But I think that um, at some point we're going to have to get that conversation on the table and figure out what, what that really looks like. To be honest, that conversation, once it takes place, and any decisions that come out of that conversation would influence some of the that is true, yeah. priorities on here that would greatly change, in my opinion, some things that are earlier on. If that were to come to fruition a lot sooner than we think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I feel comfortable with the, with the um, plan as it is right now, based on we are, just because we haven't started any further discussion. I, I mean, I know it's kind of been brought up in passing, but no real serious discussions or evaluation or observation or looking at the school has been done at this point. So I don't, yep. I, I feel that it's good, at least for now. And the good news about what you see, at least in FY19, is it puts the town on notice that we know that the security, health, tech, and hopefully some cafeteria, we will need that. Yeah, right. And everything else, every year, they'll ask for that data. Right. right. It's the best available data. Right. Right. Yeah, that's, that's it. But I really like the idea of revisiting what, what kind of space, what kind of mm -hmm. building do we want, multi learning outcomes that we need, um, what reflects um, the 21st century learning, what do we want for our town mm -hmm. in terms of schools. And, when was this building built? I know, last update, it's well before any of our In meetings. the 50s, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful build, building, served its purpose, probably still as many years left in it. So, new building, substantial upgrades to existing building, whatever that conversation is, it's worth having 50 years in to the <laughs> So yeah. we're doing the 50 year check in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think a lot of it is just to see if it's structurally sound, you know, I mean, it, yes. are we going to end up having issues where, you know, it sinks or, you know, or, or something like that, which you'd think by now would have, I guess, if it was going to, but never know, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yeah, this is good, sounds like good for June, do we need to vote on this one, or are we okay? We'll take it to your next meeting. Yeah, we'll bring it back to you. Oh, okay, got it, yeah. after it makes those adjustments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Okay, back to. Oh, I'm sorry. Are there any more business manager? I, I apologize and I thank you for moving my items forward. I, I have a policy meeting in Ware now, so. No problem. Good luck. Thank you very much. I wish I could go with you. I thank you. Really? I didn't mean it because I was leave here. Okay, okay, a little sarcastic to, about what he's off to. Back to the agenda. <laughs> Student recognition for John Earl. Yes. A very nice letter. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, uh, yeah. What so I am going to read it for the viewing audience. Dear Brian, this is a letter from Beth Ginsburg, I believe the chairperson of the PTO, not president of the, T of the Hadley PTO, and wrote it to Mr. Beck, the high school principal. Dear Brian, I'm writing this letter to recognize Hobson's Academy senior John Earl. Last week, Hadley PTO held a family night for the book fair. In an effort to increase attendance, we decided to offer a reading by a town hero. What better way to promote reading than for children to see an older, successful, well-rounded student reading? With late notice and hectic schedules, we feared we would not be able to secure a student. John obliged our request. He arrived on time and was beyond accommodating. Family night is set up in the cafe at Hadley Elementary. It is a large room and there were groups set up throughout. John picked good day, good night to read to the kids. He started out by introducing himself, letting the children know how he was a senior at Hopkins Academy. He told the children he remembers coming to the book fair during his time at HES and it was a day he anticipated and enjoyed. As he read, he asked questions and added commentary around the reading on his own without being asked. Moments after he began, there was not a single person who hadn't stopped to listen. Every adult in the room had a smile on their face. You cannot help but be drawn to this charismatic young man. We need more young leaders like John Earl. John brought an intangible presence to family night. He connected and reached out to every child gathered around him. We thank him for his kindness and providing his unpaid time to the Hadley Parent Teacher Organization. The next time you see John Earl, please recognize him for his outstanding effort. So thank you, John Earl. It's very nice. 
very nice. It was great. It was. I always like the book fair. Oh, I like. And we had another. Um, it was in the weekly email. They re. Uh, hopefully, we reinstituted this tradition of kind of the senior high five. So all of our seniors with their caps and gowns and went to the elementary school and. The students were wonderful. They lined up in the hallways, they made them cards, they stood out there, they all gave high fives. Except for in the pre-K K in one wing, um, the class advisors, the adults, and uh, some of the adults were fearful that a high five from some of our taller, stronger kids would <laughs> knock them right over. <laughs> so they all got to wave and it was wonderful. It was really great. Saw some great videos and photos. Of yeah, oh, it was, it was, it was, it was awesome. awesome. The kids were very excited to see it, so it was nice. Yeah, it's good. Okay, service field trip update. Service field trip update. So uh, the update that you have, you voted, you approved a 2019 service field trip to Guatemala. I want to be crystal clear that I was the one who said to Senora, hey, because I went to Guatemala last year, that place is great, and she'd gone there in college, and so I said you should go. And that's why I gave her all that information about a language school down there. And then, as we always do with all of our trips, we went on the United States State Department travel uh, advisory, and uh, I was, so you can see they have four levels, one, two, three, and four. Um, and one, exercise normal precautions, and I give you examples of countries that currently have a level one, Canada, Panama, Belize, Oman, a level two, exercise increased caution, so Europe, Bahamas, Mexico, and Belize twice. Belize is one, sorry. And India. Um, reconsider. Uh, Russia and Turkey are on that right now. And then do not travel. Uh, examples are Iran, Yemen, and Afghanistan right now. These levels change. They're given to an entire country. So it could be that a region is actually dictating the security level for an entire country. Um, and that, that is often the case with Central America. Right, that it's really what's happening in cities because they'll say that what the advisory is for crime, for example, but the crime is typically concentrated in capitals or in larger cities, and you don't have the same experience outside of that. And so, Senor and I met and looked at the travel advisories for all Central American countries in Mexico because the goal is this trip the students want to do service and they want to try to contain cost, which is why they're focused on Central America, Mexico, maybe Northern Latin America, South America, but that too gets challenging. Um, Venezuela, other places, which we be level four right now. Um, so you can see Guatemala is a level three. This is due to crime. And again, it's primarily the cities and the capital, although where she was going, uh, where I'd recommended, and it, it wouldn't be on its own of level three, which is Antigua, but now they just had a volcano erupt outside of Antigua. So that's, that's another bit of a hiccup on the Guatemala side of things. So there's uh, level two, so level, Belize is a level two, excuse me. Um, El Salvador, level three, Honduras, level three, Nicaragua is right now a level three. Senora had started pivoting back toward Nicaragua where she went with the children two years ago. And Nicaragua right now really is a level three because of the civil unrest. And the person with whom she's been communicating about the trip has assured her repeatedly, I feel confident that this will all be over very soon. Um, Costa Rica is a one, Panama is a one, and um, I do think I have, and Mexico is a two. Yeah, and Mexico is a two. I mean, I feel confident that it would be over two, but we don't know. Yeah. yeah. And uh, better safe than sorry in light of what we know is going on. So where we're at right now is keeping some options open. I just wanted the school committee to know that, um, and, and what Senora, God bless you, what Senora is communicating to families who are very eager, their children want to participate in this service trip, is we, we will identify a place that, that meets all of our needs to do service and a place that is safe where they can practice Spanish language skills as well. But um, we haven't, landed yet because of this, what's going on right now in Nicaragua. People, I, I still believe she can t continue with fundraising wherever they go. Um, <laughs> people should be fundraising. But we'll continually update you. And I would say 
that um, you approve all field trips, all overnight field trips, all foreign travel. We would never recommend students going to a level four country. Uh, if a country had a travel advisory of level three or the travel advisory changed, I would ask for additional explicit uh, approval from the school committee if something changed. So there's nothing for you to vote tonight. Just know we're looking at that, but I also wanted you to know we do send, children do go, they go to Europe, it's level two. Um, and so we level one and two, uh, you approve these trips anyways, but if something changed and a country was designated to level three, we'd bring you the information as to why and have a discussion. And if you said that's, you know, we don't, we don't think that that's a wise idea. We're, she's prepared to, she's also looking in, in uh, potentially Costa Rica as an option. So we're going to come back to us in the fall. It, so you've approved uh, Nicaragua at, right now. They're not going. If Nicaragua is level three, we would we would come back to you and say we want explicit approval again, knowing this is the level that it is and this is why. Mm -hmm. So um, and if something changed, you would absolutely. So no matter what, if Nicaragua is redesignated level two, this this won't. I'll update you, but you won't need to vote. So I'll continually inform you that if it's safety designation goes back to what it was when we originally approved the trip, then you wouldn't, I don't think you'd need to re-approve it. Nothing had substantively changed. And at what point do you decide, you know, this level isn't changing, we should look at our backup plan and, and switch and you come back to us for that. Yeah. So when you talked about parallel track, I think she's, she's developing a backup plan yeah. kind of right now. Actually, okay. now that they've been to Nicaragua, yeah. none of my great Guatemalan ideas off the table, especially the, the, the volcano, everything else, <laughs> that's pretty much off the table. Uh, she's, um, the idea of going back to Nicaragua is appealing because of course they've done it. So that would be very appealing. So, but she is simultaneously working on an alternative. Great. And I wanted families to know too, that we do do this on all of this. Important, thank you. And the students who go overseas, we encourage them, uh, we encourage families at those meetings to use the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program. It's free. We tell the parents enroll in STEP um, uh, so that they, they get alerts constantly if they want them while their student is overseas. And of course, our teachers do blogs and other things to communicate with parents. Yeah, school choice slots. So school choice, you have a chart in there. There's one correction you probably picked up on it. Grade two apps received is one. Grade three apps received is zero. So obviously it wouldn't make sense if we confirmed acceptance for an app we didn't get. So there was a mistake there. But this evening, what we are, what I would like to propose is we had originally said no to opening up grade five. Next year's grade five, which is the three classroom, the three teacher group where we added a teacher, and no to opening up grade six, which is the current grade five that has two classes, right? right. So next year, grade six would have two classrooms, and grade, did I do that right? And grade five would have grade three five. classrooms. Right. Uh, so originally when you voted seats, grade five and six were not open. I have met with the Hadley Education Association leadership. I have met with the uh, faculty, with faculty representatives at Hadley Elementary School. I have met with faculty representatives at Hopkins Academy. We talked a great deal about the reality of the budget. I gave them, probably, I will send it all to all of you. It's all data that you've seen, but I will send you the workbook that I sent to all of the faculty. It shows them uh, enrollment, foundation, and actual over time, birth cohort data, the things you look at from NESDEC, so the picture isn't getting better for us in terms of birth cohorts and projections, um, expenses over time, and the fact that the town now is, is quite generous in terms of the percentage above required net school spending, that Hadley now is a very high percentage above required net school spending. Um, and, and that it's, as, as you know, although we may feel, or, or some of the faculty for good reason, and they expressed um, concerns that that there are, there are students who have needs that are would be much better much better met perhaps keeping the environment very small. 
Um, they also understood and were clear that they certainly don't want to see any unnecessary reductions in terms of teaching force or supports, um, and they understand that it is hard to, it's hard to explain to the town um, when every year the request for local contribution increases. Um, it, it's hard to justify not opening, not taking in revenue. So we have interest in those grades, and that's the part that would be difficult. I feel, speaking personally, and I said all this to the faculty, and at the end of all the meetings, they were, they, they know that I'm saying to you, my recommendation is open up school choice. Um, the several members of uh, the faculty were on the same page with that, that that's, that's what they think should happen. And I was very clear that I felt that it, it's challenging to explain, particularly on town meeting floor, why um, we don't see any sort of corresponding staffing or expenditure reductions when enrollment declines. So, mm -hmm. so there's three classrooms in the in what's going to be the next grade five. Correct. There's one request, which is 47 kids, which is 15.6 children per classroom. Mm -hmm. If you divide it in three, that's a small class still by accepting that one student. It would be 20 for the grade six. The, these are still really small classes compared to a lot of other districts. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually really very much so agree with Anne's opinion that in a school that is struggling potentially down the road with budget, um, and we're sitting here talking about how can we advertise our school, how can we get more kids in, and then we go, no, 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 we're not going to open up. I don't, I don't think that we cannot open up. Well, the decision to not open up was uh, very clearly around when we had just two classes. Right. And the numbers of those two classes were, um, they were uh, kind of out of control with a very, um, especially difficult uh, group of uh, students. And so it made, it made a lot of sense to like put a halt to any kind of growth at that age group and to add a classroom. Now to reevaluate re and to ask the question, well, do we have things under control? And are, do we feel as though uh, we, we can add what is just one, one student. student that it makes economic sense to do, um, but again, if it's under control. And I, I have heard that things have been really well. At that How many degree. students are in my classes right now? Uh, so it's essentially your 46 divided by three. Is that what you're asking? Is what the current is right now. Correct, yeah. correct. And so, yeah. Three, two, one, six, two. So now that we have the situation, much more balanced in terms of what that grade should look like. It does make sense to open up those seats, especially if it's just one student. And you may open up, um, you may say, we'll open up uh, eight slots. So what we'll have to do is, once you vote, then we need to advertise by law again. We need to advertise for five days. We'll put the advertise in. It'll probably go in on June 8th. We'll advertise for that week. So we can't put we can put a cap on it though. You yeah. Say, so you're going to say right now. So you could if you say one. So if you say one in fifth grade, I was going to say you could say up to one additional per class. You could say we're going to open up three seats because we didn't advertise before. So when you advertise, perhaps more people are going to apply once we advertise. And we're still getting we're getting school choice increase as I said today. I got an email. I know I missed a deadline, but do you have any room at Hopkins? Mm -hmm. um, so once it goes in the paper again there's a very good chance that there'll be more. If there's more than the number of seats that you've approved, we have to do a lot. Speaking of advertising, have we advertised Hopkins and have the elementary school? No, Hopkins was done entirely, those ads were done entirely by the faculty. I don't know what has worked. I'm gonna assume everything is working. If you notice, do you see the projected changes in numbers that Hopkins is projected right now? And I told you I had four increase for school choice this week that aren't reflected here to have an increase of 24. 
I have the elementary is looking at a decrease of 18 next year. But, and that, even with our competition from choice and vocational, they have, they'll be up 24 right now. And that's not all of our school choice confirmed outcomes. So I'd like to think that all of the efforts of faculty have put out are, are helpful. Just so, each, sorry, I'm just curious, does each grade have two classrooms? every grade that we have in the elementary school? In the elementary school? So it depends on what column you're looking at. But if you're right now, right now, your fourth grade has three and your sixth grade has three. Right. But beyond that, the rest of them have two. Correct. If fourth and sixth have three classrooms? Mm -hmm. Right now. And so when you're looking in the left-hand column when you go to fifth, fourth and sixth currently all the mm -hmm. way to the right shows we have 46 people and 49 mm -hmm. people. So there's three classrooms for those. Sixth will go into Hopkins, mm -hmm. so they're blue. Fourth will go into fifth grade. Mm -hmm. So we, that would be fifth grade and elementary is the only one next year that would have three classes. Three classrooms. So there is the commitment to have three classrooms in fifth grade? Yeah. Next year. yeah. They will remain as three all the way through. I would be in favor of opening up three seats, one for each class. Right? And that still keeps you at 16 to 17 kids per class. Now that it's you know it's had a little bit more stability, time we've got three classes established. It just to me, just because one person applied to only advertise one seat is that seems limiting. If you could more, you could yeah, choose. you could open it up to three. And do is not being not not really knowing like what the staffing level is like in that fifth grade. Are those additional positions that have to be filled, or do we already have the teachers? So you already have the teachers. You already have what you would be voting if you had, if you said, all right, we're going to advertise three slots in grade five, and let's say three slots in grade six. So that's all. And we can do a reminder advertising then, and seats can continue to be open. You, you didn't, because you previously voted zero and zero and five and six, I cannot open slots without you voting one to say yes, we're allowing you to participate in those grades, and these are how many seats. So we'll run and add whatever you all agree to tonight for five and six, plus a reminder tagline, school choice seats available in other grades. We've already advertised those. Mm -hmm. So um, in fifth grade, that, that was before we, this, no, two, yeah, this is the first year they've been split into a club. They have three teachers, they used to be two. So we've already staffed for, they have three teachers, if students have needs um, that require um, in-classroom support, or we say B-grid service delivery, we have those services in the classroom as well. Just another quick question. That's, it's adding three seats to the current fourth, next year's fifth. Mm -hmm. And how many seats to the current fifth? Next year, six? Well, you haven't discussed that. You have three applications. So whatever you ultimately will decide, are we opening and how many seats are we advertising? And that's currently at two classes. Two classes, so 38, 19 per class. If you opened up two seats, you know, it would be 20, 20 per class. Yeah, and that would be the largest class with, like, individual class, right, based on the numbers here? in the elementary school. Everything um, else is less than 20. Yes, you have had classes higher than 20. I mean, you don't yeah. have like 25. You have had 20, 21s and 22s. And mm -hmm. um, I feel like I could probably pull my grade level enrollment over the years. I feel like even when I first got here, you had, I mean, one of the things that we've been suffering with is this enrollment. Right. Mm -hmm. And we want to keep people staying here and going into Hopkins, <laughs> and then you said the teachers were uh, supportive of this. Yeah, I mean, they certainly, their original concerns still stand, but collectively, I want to I fairly represent this. Of course, some people got back to me and said, my feeling is you have to open, open up school choice. Creating, creating these choke points ha, ha, has these other consequences. Mm -hmm. It has consequences for Hopkins, it has long-term consequences, that you simply have to do it. And there are some people who live in town and work in the district who say, 
it doesn't it doesn't make sense. Like if revenue is available to support services and expenses that increase every single year, we have an obligation to seek out that revenue. So there are many people who very feel very strongly about opening up choice. There are some people who have reservation, reservations about opening up choice for a particular grade. But, and I do believe this is an accurate representation that they also understand that if it's a question of, as they know, we had to go through this budget cutting, that budget cutting much, would have been a much different story if we didn't have news on Monday that some things had changed, right? And they were saying, well, before we start seeing these cuts, we'd rather, if that's, if that's a choice, we'd certainly rather increase revenue. So I think there are some people who would say, this is certainly not optimal, but we don't see anything that is optimal. Right, optimal yeah. is our enrollment just keeps climbing and things are easy. So I, I would propose that grade five we um, go with three seats, which is one per class, and grade six I would go with four seats, which is two per class. What do you guys think? I agree with. Um, I, I agree with you on grades six, um, the four open seats for grade six. You've got three interested mm -hmm. thus far, mm -hmm. so opening up another one that sounds reasonable. Um, I, I, I think at least three seats in the other class, and I do understand that that has been a challenging class, but you, you reduced that number by eight children by putting it into three classrooms. So I think at least one additional per class would be who of us. I mean, I get it, and I understand there's challenges, but I mean, that, that number is reduced by eight children per classroom mm -hmm. by breaking it from two classrooms to three classrooms. That's a great reduction. So I, I definitely don't, I, I definitely see the benefit going from a financial standpoint of at least having one child in the classroom would be reasonable. And I wonder if, just to play devil's advocate, if you opened up more than that one, you might not get that many applicants too. Maybe there's one classroom that could support two children more than one child. Right, that's true. And I'm just gonna play devil's advocate on the entire thing. Um, looking at the numbers of enrolled students throughout the um, throughout all twelve years, um, that forty six is not the, not even close to the lowest one. Um, so there have definitely been classes with fewer with with, with fewer enrolled. Um, and also knowing that in the fifth grade they are starting that, that more like middle school mentality of switching and going between and going between classes and trying out different things um, and hearing from teachers and stuff about how difficult about how challenging some of those um, how challenging some of those cohorts have been um, I'm just curious if we really want to um, install install something that would that could greatly affect these greatly affect these students, especially in transitional years where they could like start having a miserable experience or feel like have these empathies for them, or the parents start feeling have these empathies for them when we do want to keep them through, so they're not going to alternative schools um, for high school. Right? The things you can't but that's it could really do beautifully so, or it could be a disaster. It could be a disaster if you don't add any more students at all, right? right? Or it, it could have no impact on the students. I think we need to be, um, I think we just need to be careful. Um, we finally have that grade under control. I think adding two per class, knowing what I know, uh, as a parent of a child that's in that grade, uh, I I would feel comfortable adding one, but I can see two easily spiraling things out of control. I think we could revisit that in another year and add more, but one per class feels like the right next step. If For grade five, if you're talking grade five. Yeah. If we added three choice seats now, which would be the one per, and then 
next year looking to, I mean, our goal is to have more open seats at six, right? Because we want to get people in at six, we want to stay here at come to Hopkins. I mean, I, because we, I know we lose people in between that, but I can see where that, that might be a prudent way of at least, yes, we're going to open it up, but cautiously. And, and six is different because you've got 38, that's two, that, I mean, we, we all know that there are problem grades, there, there are, but six does not seem like one of them next year. No, I, so. I guess I mean when this fourth grade class gets to sixth grade two years from now and right. still has three classes, we may say, you know, like now's the time to we open may. up even more seats right. there. We should revisit that next year, yeah. for sure. And it is much more than so I want to be clear with the community that it isn't a hundred that and I know the faculty and staff and I've had several discussions and meetings about this. It isn't solely about the bottom line. And we have a responsibility, I think, to be able to explain to the town that gives us in FY19 the town will spend on its public schools. $1.3 million in excess of its required net school spending. And it's required in SS is low because foundation enrollment is so low. So the, the gap to get to expenses, foundation enrollment goes down, chapter 70 goes down, the required in SS goes down. The town, and I'm very grateful for this, steps in and fills the gap. And so I, I think there's also that argument of, What is the most logical thing to do? Tara, would you be comfortable with, um, you know, keeping in mind exactly what you said about we have more seats than we're really opening up right now, taking kind of that measured approach of, well, let's open it up, but maybe not open it up as fully as to per class, which we may not even get that. But if we opened up essentially three seats in five and four seats and six, then next year we can look at how, given there's three classrooms there, maybe we can beef that up again and open up even more seats than we would, than just three. Have we forgotten this in past years where we had to come back to the table where we didn't open up a class and we had to come back to the table and revisit? We have to revisit this every year. I don't mean that, though. I mean, when you approve seats, have you ever gotten more interest than the number of seats approved? I know we that that's a tough have, question. But we may have, and I don't remember. I do feel like I've, I've had you adjust school choice votes since I've been here. Um, I'm not saying that's happened every year, but I do feel like I've had you. So, your mayor's right, annually you must by law, but I do feel like I've had you adjust right. them at least one time. Um, why aren't we addressing the upcoming third grade class that's in a similar boat with zero choice seats and one um, one application received? Is that is that wrong? The, that's oh, the one that's sorry. wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, the one so moves up one. one. Which, I, I apparently not really paying that much attention. Well, and I, we <laughs> have a mistake on here. But we did not advertise. So a good question here. We did not advertise in that grade. And this is a place where I think demonstrates that it isn't just all about finances and bottom line, and I'm sure we would have gotten applications, but um, the faculty felt very strongly that that is a place where the needs of the students would, opening up school choice didn't make sense, and we're talking early elementary, and third grade is a really critical year. All early elementary is, but now they're going into third grade. This is their first MCAS testing year. And so that was a conscious decision. So that is a very small class, and it was a conscious decision to keep it that way. Can you explain why, maybe I'm missing something. Um, choice seats advertised for kindergarten was four, but we received 11, and we've confirmed 11? Because we had more space based on, so we could go over that. We had, um, that was so small, right, that it was teeny tiny. And so we had some people indicate to us that they, Either they were moving or there were changes. Yeah. And so 
we, we were able to, we haven't denied anybody a kindergarten. So do we need to adjust that though? If we only add, did we approve 11 seats for that class? Or I'm, I'm just confused. So if we advertised for choice seats for kindergarten. So we can go in excess if you open the grade, but you said no. The grade wasn't open in five and six. I got you. So if we have space you. available, we have space available, I don't have to come back every single time and say, if there's space available in the grade, then we can take kids in. Well then okay. should we should we open up grade three and two seats? I'm, I'm just asking. I know. Then you don't have to come back. I, uh, so I would say to you grade three, and I, and I do understand this, that that would be what I told the faculty that I was bringing tonight when they got the email yesterday from me, this is what the school committee will hear so they know what I'm presenting to you. It's everything I've presented thus far. I had no point said that I was going to recommend opening up grade three. It is ultimately your decision next year's grade three. I would tell you, I would not advise you to do that. And again, it is teeny tiny, but in that case, it's, it is a class, an early education grade that has some pretty significant things. In the last six years, I've seen more problems in the second and third grade time frame with three kids going through the system and like seeing every, every grade have its hiccups. That's a challenging year. It's a big year of transition coming from pre and K to that next step. It's a completely different teaching world. It is a very different, early education and care is pre-K through two. So our teachers, some most of them are one through six certified, but there are some that are pre-K through two certified. It is a huge transition. And if it's going well, I'd rather not go back because I've seen some major flips in the last six years. Mm -hmm. So my, my suggestion would be that we not mess with that. I agree with that. I mean, the only reason that I'm looking at five and six and being a little bit more stingy on it is because there's clear interest there. Mm -hmm. There's been no interest, and in if that leave well enough alone there, and then if we can reevaluate it the following year, then reevaluate it the following year. Yep. And I'm just, I'm just, I want some, I'm asking for some clarification on what you said about the kindergarten with the four and the eleven. Um, so saying if we open the grade up to um, to choice, then um, it accepts anybody that applies, or? So we're advertising this many seats. If we have, if our interest exceeds, um, and we don't have space, if our interest exceeds and we say, you know, we don't feel, we don't have space, then we have to do a lottery system. Once the grade is open, if we determine there actually is space in that grade, we've gotten information about either students going to um, a, a charter or online school instead of remaining and having their elementary school, or they're moving out of the district. So then we start taking in more choice, but you've opened the grade. We can't take slots we have no. So is that thirty? So is that thirty-four reflective of that eleven, or is it thirty-four plus eleven? It's reflective of that. Oh, okay. It's what we 34 total. Confirmed yeah, acceptance. Okay. It's okay. the confirmed acceptance. Thank 34 you. total. There's not another. That's probably something else that I missed. Or yeah. Else. So it's it's a, a, no, it's, it's, it's confusing. Been a long day. It's just no. <laughs> right. So what we're saying and is. I, yeah. And I wouldn't make, I mean, we may make a decision if we had a bunch of move outs or something strange happened, right. that there was more space in grades five and six. But really, um, if it's anything that um, there's a, a kind of a divided opinion about, let me state again faculty, the faculty has a range of opinion about this, and even those that were not in favor of opening up the grades said, I understand it's not my preferred strategy, but I understand why it's a strategy. They did not say that about next year's grade. Okay. So do we need to vote? We do. Yep. Motion to add three seats to current grade five, the future grade five, yeah, future grade five, and four seats to future grade six. Oh, I'd like to second.
favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? What if I agree with one and not the other? I guess I have to abstain. I, 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 I agree with adding classes. I agree with adding classes. But chill numbers. I agree with adding seats. So I don't, I don't want to. Are you suggesting you want to add more? November, January, you had your end of marking period half days, you just didn't have some of the ones at the beginning of the year. Okay. Any questions or concerns on the calendar? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the calendar? Motion to approve the calendar for 2018 19 school year. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, business services that was a handout and so we had one response uh, TM, uh, TMS or the management solution for a total price over three fiscal years of $190,000 375 in FY19 that would be 62,830 FY20 62,830 FY21 64,715 they uh, the checks indicate that they met all the criteria set forth in the request for proposals. Um, so my recommendation to the committee is that uh, you award the bid to uh, the qualified proposer, which is the management solutions. That would be no change in service. That is the same company we have right now. Motion to approve the bid for TM solutions. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Do business. Okay. Um, all right. So now we're going to add hop 
Hopkins Academy schedule and program offerings? This yes, so this is just, just uh, I gave something you can't see, but it's kind of pretty. I put a lot of art to it. Uh, just, this is not a final, even now it's not a final schedule because of imbalanced enrollments. But what uh, Mr. Beck and I will be just discussing with the faculty is um, let's think about are there problems here that we may need to address. What I've circled are core courses, so math, English, science, required courses, or history, where enrollments are 20 or greater. And you can see that the majority of the enrollments, of the higher enrollments, are in math. And um, these numbers do not reflect potential. Some, some school choice students we know are interested or indicated that they intend on coming here. The families have said that, but they haven't been scheduled yet. So there, there is a concern that because we've had a lot of interest in grades where we already have some pretty high enrollments in the math courses, so we've had some interest in seventh grade. You see there's one class there that right now in this schedule, which there'll be some refinements done to this schedule, you're looking at uh, enrollment of 24. So I don't want to see math classes at the middle school that have 30 kids in them. So this is just to let you know that this is a, I'm going to be saying to the faculty, Mr. Beck um, has also noticed this to say, I identify this as, as a problem, that I have some, I have imbalanced enrollments. Um, and so what are some strategies that we should be considering to address this? And we'll see where that conversation goes. What that means is that don't be surprised if we're coming to you in July or August with we need to create some sort of so of course, we need to make a slight adjustment to the schedule. But I, I just want you aware that this is a conversation the faculty will be having. And I don't have a lot more to say on it at this point because we want to hear directly from the faculty. But I won't see you again until the end of the month. So I want you to know what we would be talking about and where the schedule stands now. But you see, in some cases, we've even, there have been some minor revisions that were done recently to try to balance this more. So there could be some movement in student schedules. That's why in some cases, you we don't see numbers next to a course that may have been added or moved. And I just want to put that on your radar. If we had students coming in through school choice, these numbers would swell further? Not all school choice students, I mean, we're pretty, we know that many of them are adamant, they're coming, we just haven't studied. So just wanted to look at okay. Do you need an action on that? No. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, personal report. Oh, goodness. I think we're uh, just your long term steps. That's all we have. And who's on leave? So, not a whole lot to report yet. Yeah. Okay. Public comment? Crickets. Crickets. <laughs> all right. Don't we're all left by now. Business manager report we did. School committee reports. Family and community engagement survey. Aaron Keith. Yeah. Did you guys get to look over? And I think what we were looking for was if there's any concerns or feedback on what we did. We did make some changes. Mm -hmm. and how, you can speak to the flow of how it'll kind of show up for parents. Yeah, so we did we, we did impl implement some changes. Um, we uh, omitted any gender specific language from the questions, um, and then we added in um, a section that would be um, <clears throat> that would be optional based on the response to a question of if your child is in any special ed programs, um, and so that would be if you similar to how. If you, uh, and that's actually another different, another change we made, um, where if, just like if you say no to um, was your child enrolled in Hadley, Hadley Elementary, it'll jump to the Hopkins. So it's the same things, the functionality with the special education services. Yeah. Um, the way that the Survey Monkey was 
um, set up before. It was just a functionality of having a checkbox versus a radio dial. So you could actually hit both yes and no to mm -hmm. a lot of those questions, and then mm -hmm. you have to scroll through everything now, and you just have the one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, the, I, I, and then we changed just change some change some of the language um, from before, just to make it a little bit tighter, um, a little um, just to write tightly and just, just keep a similar voice, because it seemed like a lot of the, it seemed like the questions were just read uh, read differently um, for a, a lot of the previous one. Um, kept the vast majority of all of the we kept the vast majority of all the questions. I think we only changed out one or two of them from what they were before. And then um, moved on. And then moved to on. Have and a special on to have special education section. Okay. And then we did include we got feedback from the CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory mm -hmm. Committee, and so we um, based on their feedback of the questions, Keith and I sat down and tried to um, word questions to include. Um, essentially all the concerns that they wanted us to, and I forget how many questions we had, like seven for the special education section, to try to condense it but get to all of their questions and concerns in there. So we were able to accommodate them as well. Yeah, they, met, they, they came to us with, I believe, something like 12 or 14 questions and we were able to get them down to a smaller. I only had one suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, On question seven, which are the following tools do you find to be the most effective way to receive information? Um, I would add the superintendent email or Annie's email to that. So I had emailed out um, Annie too to ask because I don't think we use chalk talk anymore. I don't and think so, we do too. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to suggest, and I, we didn't, we figured rather than um, making all these adjustments ahead of time and have to adjust it again because I'm not going to lie, Keith is doing it in Surrey <laughs> Monkey. So to cut back on him, we figured we'd wait for any other feedback. So um, that was my thought as well, was adding in her email and yeah, it's Keith taking out Chop Talk because we don't use it. That is something that can be easily amended. Yeah. And yeah, then so the only is, other... is Chop Talk definitely not something that's... I haven't gotten any of that because, because I haven't been asked to contribute to it, and that could just it, really be something that I need to be looking at. So well, no, I, I, we're not getting them in the elementary school, and there is an other button that you can add it to if we're missing something too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we—that's another—that is one of the questions that we rephrased um, because it was originally it was like, which of these are you aware of? But yeah. we want to um, we want to get a little bit deeper into. Uh, in, into effective, effectivity, effectiveness. Got it. Great. And just a note that that question would be changed into a yeah. Yes. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, the only comment I had was I found it helpful to um, to do a test to ask a volunteer to go through the entire survey and time themselves because we we said five to ten minutes. In fact, maybe some of the data on the back end will tell you exactly how much time it took. Uh, and if we're only, if we're mostly adding questions, then it's only going to get longer. So, right. um, so I think that's why we um, sorry, uh, just uh, testing timing uh, and maybe considering just taking another red line to it. We, uh, I think that was part of the reason that we wanted to try to make it a little bit more concise um, and fewest words possible in the question so that it was quick and easy to understand what was being asked of them. Um, and then um, I think also what's helpful is um, there's a general consensus that parents in special education are willing to spend more time on things. I'm not gonna speak for general education, but I, I know that it's a general rule, parents in special education are willing to spend more time. So I think it'll cut back the survey for somebody who's not clicking on special education, that'll make it a little bit quicker to begin with because we're not, it's not going to be an NA, it's not going to be not applicable, it's going to be you're not even going to see something that doesn't pertain to you at all. So that should hopefully help. Mm -hmm. Good. And the timing for this will be when? That was going to be my next question. Um, so obviously June double X is not a date. <laughs> um, 
So when do we want to when, when do we, when do we want to have this ready by? I'm assuming this is something that's going to go out in an email from Annie. Or? Yeah, do a separate email okay. for it. Um, I can have these edits done tonight if we're comfortable with everything other than that. Um, maybe not tonight since we have to get something to try out the test on it. Um, so it's definitely something that could be sent out with today's Wednesday, so, and you would want to send it out on Friday. So it could be ready to send out this coming Monday, um, and then have it open um, for uh, what we think in like two weeks or. Open it Monday the eleventh. Maybe yeah, if you closed it the twenty second. Is that roughly our school, school committee meeting? meeting? Our mm -hmm. school committee meetings at 25th, the following Monday. So yeah, if you close it by the 22nd, and then we can have you can tell us how many what our response rates look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I have a question? Do we? Because um, I actually I want to I want to open it as quick as possible too to get it before the summer. Because I'm worried that over the summertime people may check their email less. Is, is there a general concern that there's? Um, too many emails coming out at the end of the year? Like, do we have any concerns that'll get overlooked? I don't think so. I think people are paying attention to the year, actually. Okay, yeah. good. With stuff going on, closing out the year, making sure they know when the last day of school is, all of those things. And think about, and also think about what you want in the separate line. So I'll send a separate email with this link. I'm not sure if this is a problem. Could be a problem or not. I wouldn't particularly worry about it. So you choose the subject line. I'll send it. You can tell me everything you want then. And I will send out reminders to people, so okay. it won't be in the weekly email. I will also put it in the weekly email, right. and I'll yeah. also There's indicate to people yeah. that it'll be a standing link on the website. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? I think that means that somebody could try to fill out the survey five or six times. I, I hope that person doesn't exist, but you know what they do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that I wouldn't worry about it, but that's technically what could happen. Somebody could say, wow, I'm never going to throw those results. That would, that would, that would be If somebody yeah. feels that strongly to take yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, if you're that committed, you yeah. do the survey 12 times. So I think we could circulate the link in other places like the um, friends and family yeah. school. Everywhere you can. Yeah. Can we do that? Yeah, like, sure. even like Facebook. On the Facebook page. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, would you be willing to kind of like pre-advertise it in your, in your yeah, Friday? Yeah, And, and I will open it, up on open it up on Monday. Cool. I'll commit to having these changes and have somebody else go through it and work with you on the language for the cool. email. Great. Because the hardest thing to do is decide to kill a question. Um, yeah. But I would urge you to kill as many questions as you possibly can. But I do like the branching that you did with the special ed Definitely. questions because that, that does help streamline mm -hmm. it for um, you know, general ed mm -hmm. parents that are not seeing necessarily those that set of questions. Great job. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Nice. Thank you it's work. Cool. It's exciting. Okay. Um, policy committee. We're meeting in September? You'll meet at some point over the summer. <laughs> but I can't even bring myself to think about that right now. And okay. I know I just I just we haven't met you by saying that. You will meet over the summer. And so you received all the policy um, documents separately. So you had the summary sheet, you received the track changes, and I realized I hadn't given those to you in enough time to read through all of them. So you'll vote then. That'll be the second final reading from a conversation we started back in March at your journey. Okay. Finance Tri Board. I have no update at a good time. Yeah. <laughs> They're meeting now. They're done. Um, they haven't gone recently. I don't think I've gone since we met last, so, okay. Uh, fields, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. Collaborative. Um, so the collaborative met on May 30th, and I was not able to attend that meeting, but I circulated by email a report from the executive director. Feel free to check that out. They continue to have many great accomplishments and are involved in uh, graduation from stu students that are going through their programs in their school. Um, and we just completed the um, 
review of the executive director, which is an annual requirement. Um, so that is taking place concurrently. So all in all, things are good, and feel free to check out that report. Great. Thanks for signing up. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see here. When I opened up your collaborative report, it closed my agenda. Oh, sorry. We're at action items with the approval of the currency side. <laughs> okay, approval. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. AP warrants submitted in April. Um, this one I have since it's named them. No. Uh, yes, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. If somebody would like to motion and second and vote. Uh, AP warrants. I move that we approve the AP warrants submitted in April 2018. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. Okay, approval of warrants. I have it back. Sorry. Approval of warrants submitted in April 2018. So these would be payroll. Um, is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve warrants submitted in April 2018. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approval of April 9th, 2018 minutes. Any questions on those or revisions? Okay, is there a motion? Move to approve the April 9th, 2018 minutes. Second. Second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We already did the budget, we did the school choice slots, we did the calendar, and we awarded the business services contract. Our next meeting is June 25th. Um, I would like to add as an agenda item on there and scheduling our uh, luxurious retreat and thinking about the agenda around that. We just, we've talked about it quite a bit and I know we've probably piled a lot on that meeting. And it's a full day, but. So 25, June 25? Mm -hmm. Monday the 20th. The 25th, mm -hmm. yes. I will be out of town on that day. Okay, that's Are you guys here? You're available? I am as well. Okay. Until 8 because my friend is running a ninja warrior. Oh, you're kidding. That's awesome. But oh, obviously we're taking it. Let's so not so. meet past 8. <laughs> <laughs> so let's make sure Paul's available yep. too. Okay. And if you want to just float by me some options for dates, I'm happy to. So and we're looking the location it. for that. Uh, we are looking to our friends at the Collaborative Bar to ask this to deal so we can feel like we're getting away at no cost. Yes. So that <laughs> it's not too exciting for you since you go there about six times a year, Humera, yes. but I can also ask five colleges or if you have spaces that are available to you. I was just trying to find a space that was big enough for us that was not a band room at Hopkins Academy. And um, certainly they're willing to help us out. And I'm open to any other suggestions. I'm sure I could get us into the uh, Fish and Wildlife Office, but I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I have an office at the um, Amherst Works building, and there's a vault. So it's a um, um, bank. redone bank, and one of the conference rooms is a vault. So we could be there if we wanted to. That's, that's an option. option. All right. So you can put that as would they charge you for that, or no. do you, because you already you have the space? Yeah. yeah. And I travel enough that they get money. <laughs> <laughs> they get that money's <laughs> worth because you're not there. Okay. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Oh, you need to do that. Don't you need your motion to, to adjourn the meeting? Yeah. Motion to close the meeting. Close the meeting. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.